Good afternoon, my name is Dani Renouf and I'm a registered dietitian with the Providence Healthcare Renal Program. I work in pre-dialysis and it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today about joyful eating and movement in kidney disease. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, physiotherapist Judy Lau and patient partner and certified yoga instructor Tamara Graham for their contribution to this presentation. So please make sure that you listen in on their segments as well as they tie in very well with the lifestyle uh, therapies that we are discussing today. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the territories on which we are gathered as the ancestral homelands of the Squamish, Salish, and tsleil nations, and I feel very grateful and thankful to work and play on these ancestral lands. A general disclaimer before I get into the details of my presentation, the information that I will provide does not replace the recommendations provided to you by your individual health practitioner or healthcare team. If you have specific questions about your health needs, please consult your family physician or healthcare provider for individualized care and guidance. First, I'll describe a bit about the role of the dietitian. This is especially important if you are new to the kidney care program or a clinic in your area. And so when we call, our objective really is to be part of your healthcare team and to help support you through your healthcare journey. It's very important to start exploring nutrition and lifestyle goals early on in the kidney care process so that you are set up as best as possible for the chronic nature of the condition. And we all know that kidney disease is progressive. And so it's very important to slow progression through healthy measures that you can have full control of, which include your nutrition, your mindfulness, and your physical activity. Uh, we really honor and respect your individual health journey, and there's really no wrong or right. Um, it's really just about getting to know you better um, and understanding your needs so that we can help provide you with the resources you need to, to be successful in your goals. It's also a, a great exercise to start setting lifestyle goals and activities for yourself because this can help you really manage your health condition. And like I mentioned, prevent and delay health complications. This isn't just an opinion, this is evidence-based. And for the past 20 years, our guidelines have indicated that people who focus on their nutrition, their physical activity, and their overall well-being and quality of life tend to do better in the long-term, no matter what their health trajectory looks like. The purpose of my presentation today is really to give you very general information. I am not able to go into the specifics of your individual needs because that requires more time. Um, and therefore it's really important to book an individualized visit with your dietitian uh, in your program to make sure that you have your individual questions answered um, and that they are relevant to your needs. I hope to provide an impact on the how, the what, and when of eating, and how our food choices and eating patterns can really impact our overall health and quality of life. And finally, to help provide some tips on how to improve and manage your symptoms related, through, uh, related to chronic kidney disease through your lifestyle goals. So this image is really reflective of the big picture of eating because food is not just about nutrients. It's not just about getting your vitamins. It's about an experience and food can be joyful and food can be not so joyful. So I hope that through my talk, you will find the silver lining in all of this um, and, and to really take to heart the importance that food plays and the importance that your cultural traditions, the ways that you enjoyed your meals, whether that's with people you know, in your family or whether that involves you cooking a bit more, um, whether that means just taking a break and sitting down turning off all the devices around you and just enjoying your meal, looking at the colors, the textures, all that is a very, very important part of managing your health through nutrition. So I hope that uh, you will look um, at food differently, uh, not just as nutrients, not just as the must have and must not, the bad foods, the good foods, really getting away from that black and white thinking and looking at food from a more holistic angle. 
So I work with a lot of patients. I've been in my role for the past five years. It's been an incredible learning experience for me. And I've learned so much from the feedback that I get from patients. And most of the patients that I talk with, especially at the beginning of their visits with me, uh, really speak about all the restrictions that have been put upon what they can and cannot eat. And they also talk about some days I work on some things and other days I don't feel like working on it. Um, I know that it's the rest of my life and I don't really wanna be on a diet. I know that having the right support can help me get through this. And sometimes I realize that I need my family and friends to know about my condition so that they can help me prepare foods and to plan better for meals that are going to fit my individual needs. It really involves looking at parameters that go above and beyond body weight. Body weight has uh, brought with it a great deal of stigma and a great deal of actually health problems when people are aiming for a number on the scale. It's very important to look at other parameters of success and outcomes of health, such as labs, quality of life, your energy level, your sleep, how much activity you're able to do, how well you feel, how your mood is. All these are really important parameters that exceed expectations far beyond what weight can provide. It's also very important to look at health from a self-management lens. We really take the patient-centered approach where you're in the driver's seat. You control you know, the actions that you complete. We provide you with some recommendations and guidelines, but really you decide how it's all going to fit into your life. This is a tough challenge and it's a big learning curve at the beginning, but it is possible and you, know, you can do it. It's, a, it's definitely a mindset that works well and can work successfully long-term. And self-management really relates to the, the skills um, that we have in our toolkit in order to be able to take care of our health. So if, if you're more confident about knowing what your medications mean, if you're more comfortable understanding what the blood work results mean, um, if you are better at anticipating when your mood is, is low and when you're more energetic and can take on things, these all really speak to self-management of your overall health. And the support is really our role, what healthcare providers can provide, um, such as maybe teaching you how to track your blood sugar levels, how to do blood pressure monitoring at home, um, when to go for your labs so you can get the best results. When do you time your exercise, your meals, your snacks, that type of thing. And so once we provide you with that general information, then you can decide what goals you wanna set based on that. Um, I always love, talking to patients and, and asking the question, you know, what matters most to you today? What do you want to talk about today? And when patients have a sense of what that looks like and how I can be a support to them. Um, speaking of which, the uh, BC Reno website is a great resource. We have, along with these webinars, many other tools that can help you with the self-management strategies. And if you ever have questions about any of the resources online on the BC Renal website or elsewhere that you found, please do review them with your healthcare provider because some of them can be very helpful tools while others may um, not have the most reliable information. So it's always good to really check out um, the things that you find online. This particular resource is a good example of utilizing some of these self-management techniques and strategies. So here it shows what this particular lab test means, such as estimated GFR, and please realize it's an estimate of kidney function. So it's not precise, it's an estimate. And so based on that estimate, you can find out where you are at in the stage of kidney disease. And then um, the other columns indicate what this measures, why is this important, and what you can do to help manage that measure and make sure that it stays at, a, at the best level possible. 
The same goes for ACR or urine albumin to creatinine ratio and so on. So many of the blood parameters, the lab parameters that are taken are actually influenced by nutrition. And so a dietitian can review your monthly blood work or your routine blood work with you. I would say it's actually really quite important to have your blood work reviewed at least once a year with a healthcare professional, just to make sure that um, you are aware of the numbers and how they rank compared to before. And so where you need to focus um, moving forward. So what does managing self-management, I guess, in the realm of nutrition look like? So these are some examples that we might sometimes take for granted, but these are things that you might be doing and, and successfully so in, in order to manage your health. The first thing that comes to mind is really label reading. It's very, very um, important to understand how to read a food label appropriately and sort of succinctly so that when you're shopping, you're not spending hours and hours reading labels. And a dietitian can help you go through step by step what to look for on a label and even what products to choose when you're grocery shopping to make it easier on yourself. Uh, even coming up with a grocery list that you stick to uh, that includes a lot of choices that are going to benefit your health and benefit your, your symptom management, whatever that looks like, making a grocery list, planning your trip uh, to the grocery store, staying on track with that list and doing some recipe planning as well. So cooking more at home, being in the kitchen um, requires a little bit of planning and your grocery list needs to really match the ingredients and recipes that you plan to use. Really important to sort of have leftovers handy, for example, um, so that you're minimizing food waste and you're also eating in restaurants less often and packing those leftovers for the lunches. This is all a bit of a learning curve for some of us, right? For dietitians, this is what we do all the time. It comes as kind of like second nature to us. But for many of us who don't have a nutrition background, this is all uh, going to require planning. And so it doesn't come overnight and you definitely we need to take things step by step and really look at your life. What's your home life like? What is your cooking ability and time for that? Um, you know, what ingredients do you need to avoid? What ingredients do you want to include more of? These are all really important considerations. And so we do uh, work closely with you to make sure that uh, whatever goals you have are going to be tangible and guarantee some, some good outcomes for you so that you can build on them over time. And I also want to say there's nothing wrong with a donut once in a while. There are, there is room for all that. Um, and there are simple pleasures in life. And that's very, very important to consider when you're managing a chronic disease. I see it so many times that people are restricting so much of what they take in because they're worried about their outcomes and, and fairly so, but sometimes you might be over restricting. So it's really important to talk with a dietitian to find out what that balance can look like and what could work for you. Blood pressure is a very important self-management tool. And it's amazing when I talk to people and, and they're actually just feeling so much joy and pride in the numbers as they watch their sodium intake, as they you know manage their medications, once they understand when to take them, once they understand how to properly do their blood pressure at home, it's incredible how successful this can be in highlighting when you might have a high blood pressure and curbing that so that it's not a pattern that you're not aware of. It's so important to control blood pressure because blood pressure drives Kidney, kidney disease progression. And uh, really it's the main cause of kidney disease uh, worldwide. Um, and so salt restriction, which is easy and difficult at the same time, can really, really help to control blood pressure. And it can also help control how much protein is lost in the urine. So if you're someone who's living with a kidney condition where you spill more protein in the urine, really taking a, a magnifying glass to the salt will help a lot in, um, in managing that. And so some of the replacement for flavor when you're taking away the salt is really important. And it does require a bit of, you know, assembly, it, even if you're not cooking everything from scratch, maybe considering to dilute some of the, the soup bases that you normally use or add vegetables to whatever you're eating um, so that you're diluting out the sodium in various ways. And again, a dietitian can help you work with that. 
it's important that even though we say 2300 milligrams per day is the sodium restriction we recommend, then in fact, any type of sodium reduction is beneficial to delaying progression of kidney disease. So on the label, what are the types of things that you want to look for? Well, first of all, you want to really look at the serving size. It's very important to, to find out how much of this food am I actually eating and is it even a big deal in terms of sodium? Uh, so the serving size is really important. Do not worry about calories. I know they're highlighted in big, bold black letters, but they don't really mean anything because your individual diet depends on a balance. And again, your dietitian can help you troubleshoot what that looks like. Um, if you're looking for fat, I would say look at trans and saturated fat and just make sure you're aiming for a product that's got less of these present. If you're looking for sodium, sodium is less than 15% per serving. So this particular product has 160 um, uh, milligrams of sodium and 7% salt So it's or sodium. So it's less than 15% if I take two thirds of a cup. Dietary fiber is so important, and I'll allude to this when we talk about gut health and digestive health, but anything, any product that has a higher fiber content is a winner. So this one is 14%, which is well above 5%, so it's a great fiber source. Um, and then again, you want to look for total sugars, and really less than 5 grams is what we want. Some labels will now have potassium on them, and really the goal is less than 4% for potassium. Again, I would look at the ingredients because if I have a, a potassium additive, uh, that would be listed under the ingredients. So please check the ingredients list as well to see if the word potassium comes up. And if it does, then you know there's artificial potassium in this product and it's not a suitable product for people living with kidney disease. The same goes for phosphate. If you read the ingredient label and it says anything with the word phos in, as part of the ingredients, then you know that that product has phosphate additives and therefore those types of products would not be suitable for people with kidney disease. Blood sugar control is so important. About 50% of the patients we see in our program or more present with diabetes uh, to our kidney care clinic. And they present with diabetes that is not well controlled. And improvements in any way to, to better blood sugar control can really help manage your potassium. It can help manage the levels of protein in your urine, and it can also help manage the amount of acidosis or acid that builds up in your body, which can also damage the kidneys. So high blood sugars are, can be quite detrimental to kidney health, and it's very important to work with your healthcare team and your dietitian, your pharmacist, uh, your physician, your nurse, um, in, in combination to help you bring the blood sugars down to an optimal level. So there may be other reasons why blood sugar is high and quite often it can be stress related, it can be medication related. So a diabetes center can also be a great option for you if you don't have a diabetes specific team that's looking after your diabetes management. It's very important to have some type of blood sugar monitoring at home rather than relying just on the three monthly hemoglobin A1C, which determines the average of blood sugars over a three month period. There are accuracy issues at times with looking at an average. And so it's very important to know the diurnal or the daily variations that are present in your blood sugars. And so having a glucometer, which you can obtain from your pharmacy or your diabetes center, or uh, looking at other ways of glucose monitoring will be really important. It's also important to note that people with diabetes are at higher risk for cardiovascular events, so heart health issues. And so good diabetes control can really help improve overall circulation outcomes long-term, including the heart health. So it's really important um, to sometimes focus just on the diabetes control before anything else, because it helps protect the other organs. 
We work a lot with people whose potassium levels have risen. And, you know, it's whenever we phone a patient or, or we have a meeting around potassium, uh, we really jump to some of the fresh fruits and vegetables that cul as culprits. But what we now know is that sometimes potassium isn't about what you eat. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. So it's really important that when we call, um, we go through a series of questions with you, not just related to what you ate, but also how your blood sugar management is, if that's relevant to you. How is your digestive health? Because if you're constipated, you're hanging on to potassium in your body much longer than if you had regular bowel movements. So we will explore that and find out what we can do to help improve your fiber intake and to look at other ways of preventing constipation and digestive issues. There are unfortunately medications that are absolutely necessary for your kidney health and for your heart health, but as a side effect, they may raise potassium levels. Now, even though it's not something you ate, the consequence is that we still need to be careful with potassium sources in the diet. If you have a lot of losses, uh, such as those uh, occurring through diarrhea or digestive disease, then you may also show up as having higher potassium levels. If you're dehydrated or have had surgery or any type of blood loss that's been uh, significant, you may also develop a high potassium. So potassium is really about patterns over time and looking at your medical history as a whole for a good assessment. Phosphate is also something that may rise in people who have kidney disease. It often happens later in the disease process. So people who have um, earlier stages of kidney disease may actually have quite good phosphate clearance. And phosphate is mainly the mineral that's present in bone. And so with kidney disease and as it progresses, um, there are some issues with parathyroid hormone release. And so when parathyroid activity goes up, usually the phosphate in the blood goes up and the calcium in the blood goes down. And so bone health really does suffer long-term as a result of this. In order to help restore the balance, sometimes people will need a vitamin D supplement. And so your doctor, again, will look at your parathyroid hormone activity, your calcium and your phosphate balance. And um, sometimes the dietitian might suggest um, some additional calcium sources through the diet. Um, and maybe sometimes you even need a calcium supplement with meals. And so that's uh, the trajectory generally of how we're involved in bone mineral metabolism management. But again, it's something that may not be relevant to you if you are uh, sort of um, more uh, earlier in your kidney disease trajectory. So I spoke a little bit about potassium and phosphate and how there's two types. There's the natural type, which occurs in natural foods, whole foods, things that basically aren't processed. Any food that comes in a package is automatically a food that is processed, but the degree of processing will vary. And the way that you can know that as best as possible is to read the ingredients on the nutrition label. So synthetic forms of potassium and phosphate are found in additives and they are found in packaged foods. Potassium is often used as a flavor enhancer or a salt substitute, for example, in half salt or no salt. So when you're choosing alternatives to salt to flavor your food, please make sure you're not accidentally choosing something that is a potassium salt. There are also potassium fillers in many over-the-counter medications and supplements, uh, liquid drinks, herbals, et cetera. So please, please do ask a dietitian or your healthcare provider before you buy or start a new supplement or extract or anything like this from the health food store. Now, natural sources of potassium and phosphate are very much part of a healthy eating pattern. And I know I get feedback on this all the time. Why are you telling me to eat nuts and beans and lentils and tofu? I was told not to eat these things by my doctor or by somebody else. Well, this is the most current information that we have. And literature is evolving. Science is always evolving. 
you just kind of have to hang on. And I know that's asking a lot, but um, really our job is to keep as current as possible and to look at the evidence and the literature out there and to give you the best information possible. So this is actually probably really good news for those of you who enjoy nuts and seeds, who enjoy plant-based proteins, dairy, fruits and vegetables. Please make sure you're not eliminating these food groups from your diet. If you are currently not using any of these foods or at least one food group from this list, please do try to speak to a dietitian because um, you may actually be running into some deficiencies. And so we would need to review your uh, sort of overall pattern and make sure that you're um, not deficient. So here's just the image of uh, the blessing to include all these foods. And in fact, plant-based eating, which you might see more and more of, is, is a vital part of protecting your kidneys. Now, if you may, if you wish to go vegetarian, that's your choice. We're not asking for that. We're asking really to consider putting some vegetarian meals into your week. And so right now, when I look at most of my clients' diets, they are heavily still based on meat products or animal-based products. So even if we can get a, a vegetable soup in there for a lunch or a bean burrito, um, you know, having a peanut butter sandwich or nuts uh, as a snack instead of choosing um, other foods, especially processed meats or cured meats, uh, that would be preferable really on your overall kidney balance. Um, I also notice that most of my clients lack dietary fiber from whole grains. They lack dietary fiber from fruits and vegetables. They're probably not getting enough calcium from dairy. And all this is based on restrictions that may have been, um, been related to older uh, information. And so please do on an annual basis, at least check in with your dietitian for updated information and recommendations. Muscle mass loss and protein status is something I work with all the time. It pretty well affects every patient with chronic kidney disease, especially if they also have diabetes, especially if they also have underlying heart disease, because these inflammatory states of disease actually accelerate muscle mass loss. So just by having a diagnosis of diabetes or chronic kidney disease, you are someone who is more at risk for losing muscle mass than someone who doesn't have those diagnoses. So it's very important that a dietitian or a healthcare provider tracks your muscle mass, not your body weight, but how you're doing with your muscle mass. And there are ways that we dietitians assess this subjectively by doing some uh, sight checks on your face, your arms, your legs, uh, certain areas of the body where we look for muscle mass loss. But you can also assess this based on your tolerance. If you were someone that could easily sit to stand, you know, 10 times in a row, but now it's much harder to get up once you're seated, you know you're getting more frail. If you need walking aids or if the walking distance is not as long as it used to be, all these things are indicators that you're getting more frail. Now, frailty is something that we can address with good nutrition and a proper physiotherapist assessment uh, for activities that are safe for you to do at home um, and independently. So I think it's very important to uh, really be your own best assessor and just make sure that you're not losing muscle mass at a rapid rate. And even if you notice slight muscle mass loss, that's an important thing to report to your dietitian. So you can see here that over time, if we don't address protein losses, uh, they can lead to wasting. And if you have less muscle mass as a person um, with advanced kidney disease, your trajectory for how you will do no matter what uh, direction your kidney care goes in is not going to be as good because if people have muscle mass loss, they're more likely to get sick, their immune status is weaker, they're more likely to be hospitalized, and they're more likely to have um, just overall circulation issues and difficulty controlling their diabetes uh, and so forth. And so it's really important that uh, this uh, issue of muscle mass and protein status balance out as best as possible. And, and again, working with your team can help with this. 
So protein requirements, what's really important, I always liken people with chronic kidney disease to people who are running a bit of a marathon. You need to fuel your body. And if you don't eat regularly throughout the day, your body is going to break down more muscle in order to provide itself with energy and fuel. And so it's really important to have those meals, to make sure each of those meals includes some protein, make it a plant-based protein if you can, and limit your protein, of course, to about the size of the deck of cards, which is about 90 grams, no more than that. It's about three servings. And that goes across the board because total protein load is a big deal for the kidney. And if you sit down and have all your protein at one meal, the full day's budget all at one meal, your body's only going to use what it's going to use. And the rest is going through your kidney, which is going to put more pressure on that uh, vital organ that you're trying to protect. If you can, please choose the leanest cuts of meat possible and aim for fish when possible. Salmon is a great choice because it has omega-3 fatty acids and they in fish are the best in terms of protecting your circulatory system. And also the second piece is choosing cooking methods that really impart a lot of flavor without having to add a lot of fat or salt or you know, uh, grill um, various grill sauces or seasonings, things like that. So you may want to use um, techniques such as marinating and lemon juice, vinegar, olive oil, fresh herbs, like the first image. You may wish to barbecue, um, you know, proteins in order to get that bit of flavor there. Uh, or you may wish to grill fish in the oven using parchment paper to protect it from drying out. And then you can add your aromatics and flavor components to the parchment paper. Um, and that's a really great way of, of adding flavor and keeping the product nice and moist, um, especially when it comes to fish. We are very fortunate as well to have access as dietitians and as patients to a nutritional supplement program. So if you're enrolled in a kidney care program in the province of BC and you have issues maintaining your weight, you're not eating as well, your appetite is down and you're losing muscle mass, you may need kidney specific nutritional formulas. So they're listed here. Uh, one is Suplena that we often use and the other is Nepro. Those are the ones that we use, but we have others. These are just examples of some. And the way that this program works is a dietitian needs to do an assessment. And if um, the assessment shows that you require a nutritional supplement, these will be ordered through pharmacies that we partner with and it's delivered to your home. So it's a great program to ask about if you think you need supplements. This is an area that is ever growing in terms of evidence and literature, and that's gut health in chronic disease. Like I mentioned before, with protein energy wasting and chronic disease, gut health also suffers greatly with long periods of chronic inflammation. And that's what's happening in cardiac disease, in diabetes, and in kidney disease. And so this uh, process of chronic inflammation disrupts the gut health. And the, the way to really counteract that is to eat a higher fiber diet. And so when you read about higher fiber diets, one good way to look for recipes is low glycemic index recipes because they're automatically higher in fiber or DASH diet recipes or Mediterranean diet recipes. These all inherently include more fresh fruits and vegetables or frozen or canned, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it, I know affordability is a big, big part of this. So as long as you include fiber and in vegetables and fruit sources, you try to include beans and it's, it's absolutely fine if they're canned. In fact, canned beans are lower in potassium. So you don't have to worry about their potassium content. They've already been processed. Um, canned lentils are the same. So if you're choosing things that are a plant-based and vegetable and fruit-based, you know, really your grocery bill is actually going to be much more cost-effective and you can reserve meat for a few times a week, fish a few times a week, chicken a few times a week. So you're offsetting some of the animal proteins with the plant-based eating. So what I was talking a little bit about chronic inflammation causing is what we refer to as dysbiosis. So when the gut is not healthy, the gaps between the cells and the gut lining get a bit larger. And so bacteria can actually get in. 
However, we can completely revitalize the gut through using food. And the power of food is incredible here because if we just look at whole grains, we look at fruits and vegetables, we look at plant-based proteins, natural probiotics like kefir, which is a, a fermented food. Um, you can make your own sauerkraut. It's very easy to make. Kimchi, these are all natural fermented foods that have a great probiotic uh, value. And so the probiotic piece is really the bacteria that are really good for your gut. And what those bacteria do is they ferment the food that you eat and mainly they ferment fiber. So if you have a whole grain, um, you know, piece of bread that's fermented by the gut bacteria that are good. And so that uh, side effect is that your gut environment just becomes a lot healthier. So think of your gut as a garden, right? If we want to grow a diverse garden, we really need to nourish it with a diverse amount of food so that the good bacteria can flourish and the bad bacteria can subside. So on the converse side of things, if you drink alcohol, if you choose processed foods, if you take a lot of supplements that aren't necessary, in some cases, if you have gluten um, intake and you're intolerant, or you use artificial sweeteners, these may disrupt your gut uh, health and your the garden, right? And so using these foods in, in you know, limited amounts or in moderation, and really this is the piece where we look at goal setting and mindfulness and asking ourselves, do we actually want this food? Do we have a craving for it? Or has it become a habit, right? So if it's a craving, sometimes you have to give into cravings, that's okay. But if it's becoming a habit for you and um, it's building up over time, these are things that you might want to consider as goals and, and start to work on. So how do we bring it all together, right? It's not about individual foods, not eat this, eat that. I hope this presentation really showcased the diversity that you have as a person living with chronic disease to, to eat whatever you want that fits in with your cultural preferences, your home environment, your budget, all those things that can all be worked with. Um, but where you might want to start is looking at some websites for recipes, because recipes are really how we eat, right? We cook meals, we assemble ingredients. And so if you really love a Mediterranean dish, or if you really love a Chinese style food, there is a recipe out there that you can safely prepare at home that's delicious, that's got a lot of flavor that will bring joy to your life. And it will also help meet your nutrition needs. This is really what I do a lot of the time. Once I provide information to patients, the next level is, you know, how do we bring this to life in your home? And so you've got all these different people that you're catering uh, to in terms of their needs. You've got a tight schedule. What are some recipes that are easy to make? And, and you know, once you start making one recipe, you'll have leftovers. So then it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy and you're eating a few really good meals um, that, that you have leftovers from. So it's, it's really really important that to understand that there's no good and bad food. And if there's ever anyone that tells you that, I would just flag that and, and run it by uh, another person, run it by a dietitian, okay? Um, if someone tells you, do not choose an entire food group, like eliminate all wheat, eliminate all dairy, unless you have a true allergy, you know, which is are very rare in our population, true allergies are real, but they're very rare. Um, you know, please don't eliminate food groups. This will only um, make matters worse with time. And so I hope you can appreciate that the majority of, of us can eat the majority of the foods that are available to us. So what does joyful eating look like? This is a little bit of homework for you, just reflections that I hope you might ask yourself. And I really do ask myself these questions when I'm you know, developing a recipe or I'm doing a video um, for my online audience um, is, is really exploring and acknowledging what matters to you in that moment. What are some of the best memories that bring you joy when you think about food? What are some of your grandma or grandma's dishes or your mom's 
you know, favorite foods that she made? Um, what are some things that you grew up with learning to cook uh, that take you back to college or school? These are great, great places to start from and really get inspired by. And what are some traditions you have around food? I personally love to hear them um, because we can always learn from each other's traditions and, and make new ones together. Um, what's a positive environment for you? And what's a negative environment for you? Because, you know, looking at negative environments around food is, is a huge part of what I explore with my clients. Uh, so much has been put out there that is causing negative feelings, even if we're not always aware that they're there. And that's affecting our overall health. So looking at what a positive environment looks like and where can you go for trusted nutrition information so that you can start trusting your own decisions about what you're eating and what you're choosing and really believing that you're making the best decision for your health. So I hope that you will consider speaking to a dietitian uh, to, to address various areas of importance that involve your nutritional goals, such as cultural traditions, cost of food, food prep time, meal planning. We're also clinicians. So we don't only do recipes um, that are based on, you know, uh, no science, we base everything we do on science. And so we look at your laboratory results, we look at your overall, um, you know, other medical conditions, your um, emotional health, what's possible for you in your home environment. We talk about those things with you and we walk with you as you set your goals up and we wanna make sure that they're going well. So sometimes we may call you more often initially um, to check in and, and getting regular follow-up is really important when you're setting goals. So I hope you will consider including a dietitian as part of your healthcare journey. And our door is always open. We work outside of clinic times um, and we set up virtual vis visits with you um, at your convenience. So if anything comes up that's of concern, it's really important to get that individual assessment. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this uh, presentation just started to open the door to some more questions that you might have. And like I say, the content of this was quite general. So if you do have follow-up questions or you would like more webinars of this kind, but maybe with a more scientific focus on a certain area, please do reach out to BC Renal and we'd be happy to accommodate that. Thank you so much.